My name is Gloria Kanzader Wellburn. My targeting started June 15th, 2009. There were tiny little drops coming from my ceiling. And I looked and like, well, I figured the kids were out of school. Maybe they had some kind of object. When I turned to the mirror on my wall, there was animated objects crossing all over the mirror. And I'm wondering how can this happen with the curtains drawn, blinds pulled, what's going on? So this went on until about four or five o'clock in the morning when I decided to call the police. I called the police and asked to meet them around the corner at Wawa's. Uh, they met me there. When they asked me my name, I gave him my name and he did a 180. He said, where do you live, Gloria? And I'm like, wait a minute, um, I live at 101 Walnut Street. He said, come on now, didn't we decide there was no house on that property? I'm like, wait a minute, maybe you don't have the right person. Well, who do you think I have? I don't, I don't know. I still think I'm dreaming. Anyway, a uh, day or so later, a neighbor came across the street as I pulled in from work, Carl Mayo, he said to me, they said you're losing it. I said, losing it? And I turned and looked at my car thinking it was gas or oil I was losing. I said, well, I don't see anything, what are you talking about? No, they said you're losing your mind. I said, they? Who is they? He said, the chief of police, which is Eugene Garnier, and the borough of Morton. The borough of Morton? I said, well, just tell them when I stop working, then I've lost it. Well, a few nights had gone by, and these weird sounds were like coming directly to my ear that would wake me up three, four o'clock in the morning. So this one particular night, I decided, well, I'm going to go to bed early, take my shower, go to bed, whatever time this noise wakes me up, I'll get up and run the vacuum, do things around the house. Well, I was laying in bed about 6.30, 7 o'clock that evening. A blow hit me to the left side of my face. It was so hard. I sat up in the bed and cupped my hands because I thought my nose was either going to bleed or my eyes were going to roll out. That's how hard the hit was. I sat on the side of the bed for a few moments and I decided, well, maybe this is the beginning of a, a stroke. So I'll go up to the hospital and see what's happening. When I got, got to the hospital, the doctor said to me, um, I can help you with your physical, but everything else you'll have to see someone else. I said, okay. So immediately they diagnosed me with a delusional disorder. All right. So they said, well, we're going to take you to uh, another hospital. Well, when I knew anything, here's some gentlemen, police officers. They had a white coat. They strapped me in it. They took me to Chester Crozier Hospital. They said there wasn't enough room there. So they took me to another hospital uh, in the middle of that transport. Now, this is the second ambulance ride. In the middle of that transport, on the highway, I was then taken out of that ambulance and placed in another ambulance. So when we got there, it was uh, Brook Glen uh, Behavior Hospital. They told me I was suffering from delusional disorder. The next morning they said, we're gonna let you sleep in late so we can uh, you know, get some rest. Get All right. The next morning the nurse comes in with a little cup full of pills and said, here's your medication. I said, I'm not on medication. What is it? Well, it's something for your stomach. It's something for this. It's something for that. I said, who gave, well, where did it come from? She said, the doctor gave it to you. I said, who's my doctor? I don't have a doctor here. Okay, so they left the, the room. A few minutes later, I received a phone call. It was from my daughter. She was crying. She said, Mommy, please, please do what they tell you to do. 
I said, okay, Autumn, I'll do what they want me to do. So every day I would make it to the nurse's station and I would put the pill in my mouth. I made it a ritual. I would put the pill in my mouth, drink the water, I walk down the hall and I would spit as hard as I could the pill in the toilet. Then I would raise my foot and flush the toilet. That was my daily ritual. The doctor told me when he met, I finally met the doctor, oh, you came in, you were screaming and cussing and yelling. I said, well, I beg to differ with you because even on my worst days, I don't behave like that. I said, um, all of these cameras around here, I want to see a rerun of that. Well, he stopped right there. I said, well, and to take two pills a day, it's just too much for me. So he says, okay, I'll, I'll make it one a day, which he made it one pill a day, but he upped the ante on the pill. So I'm still not taking this pill. Uh, I decided maybe I should take one pill at night and see what the effects are be so I can have a discussion with the doctor. Well, I took the pill, it was called Respidol. I took the pill that night. I thought, okay, I'll sleep it off. I woke up the next day at 6.30 so they could take your vital signs. I found myself, every time I sat down, I, I would doze off. I'm like, oh no, I'm, not gonna, I'm going back to my ritual. So once again, I was the first one at the nurse's station every night, took the pill, went through the motion, went down the hall, spit it out as hard as I could, took my foot and flushed the toilet. That's what I had to do with the pill. Well, I went to the chief of police. I would call them and they would come scurrying out every time. And they would always say, do you want to go to the hospital? Do you want to go to the doctors? Because they kept me for eight days at this hospital. And within 72 hours, I was on closed circuit. I spoke with a judge and a lawyer. The judge said, Gee, Mrs. Wellburn, you sound fine. I don't see why you can't go home. The doctor did a flip. Oh, no, she needs 20 days. She needs at least 20 days. I said, these people don't know me. Why do I need 20 days of this? So it just so happens, it turns out a lovely social worker came a young African-American social worker and she was looking for me in the day room and she looked around, looked around. So finally they called my name. She said, um, I saw you sitting there, but I thought you were a doctor or, or, or someone in training. I had no idea you were a patient. I said, well, I am. And she said, why? I said, I don't know why. I got hit what appeared to be a light but it was so hard, I went to the hospital because I thought maybe this was the beginning of a stroke. At the time, I was 58 years old. Okay, um, after that happened, I continued to, when I would go out to work, I have a housekeeping service. It was as if someone had taken a quarter and threw it the length of a football field and I would get a hit on this side of my head that side of my head, just anywhere in my head area. And I noticed at the end of the day, I was exhausted. For two days, I hid out, for two weeks, I'm sorry, I hid in my daughter's house because I just, I couldn't face it anymore. And what they would do at night, they would pull, you could have the, uh, the street lights and you would have the moonlight in your house, but they would pull all of the light out of the room until it was pitch black. And as this was occurring, I rolled off of my daughter's sofa and got crawled to her door and hit it. I said, Autumn, they're about to start with the lights. So she stood there with me. And lo and behold, a few lights came down on the curtain. So, but they didn't take her word for it. They still didn't take her word for it. The police, every time they came out, would you like to go to the hospital? Would you like this to happen? So one time I called a private detective. The last name was Goldman, which he was um, a crook, I feel. I feel he was a crook. 
uh, he came, he sent a gentleman out, he said the gentleman worked for the FBI. During that time, all of the filming, because they use microwave cameras, all of everything stopped. You could hear a pin drop in the community. One of the little boys was so upset that they stopped the filming, he asked, why do we have to stop the filming? If I may use this word, which I don't use it in my vocabulary very often, I've seen her fucking before. Why do we have to stop the filming? Now this kid, I give him 11 years old, the most. But they continued, I was harassed, I lived on the corner, I was harassed by three houses. I saw the chief of police go to one gentleman's house one morning and that afternoon I hadn't been in my home for about two or three weeks and I asked the friend of mine that works with me, I said, Nick, would you please go home with me? I want to take a shower in my own shower. He said, all right, I'll sit downstairs. I come out of the bathroom with the towel around me and I find this ray of sun about this big and I'm like, now what the heck is that? I looked at the under, other windows. So I just go over to the window, rip it open. Here's my neighbor, John Phillips, standing at the very corner of the sidewalk, something in his hand placed to my window like that. And when I said, you SOB, and I ran downstairs, but he was gone. When I called the chief of police about it, his words to me were, Donna and John don't want you. Well, that's John's wife. I said, I never said Donna. I said, John Phillips. Every day my house was broken into. Um, my, any paperwork I had, it was written on. They would cross out things and write in other things. They would leave their initials. I have the initials to all the people. Um, as a matter of fact, whenever Mr. Phillips came into my home, he always left a calling card, something with the name Phillips on it. So, this orange shirt, orange, that's what they started perping. That's what we call perping. That's what they started perping me with. Everywhere you would look, you would see orange. You would see a crew of men working. They all had orange on. You would see anything going on. They all had orange on. So I'm like, what is with this orange? They wanted you to become hypersensitive to certain things. So they would run the orange color. The chief of police, they had a, a, the 4th of July parade, red, white, and blue. He had orange and black. That's what they wore during the parade. Okay. Um, after my stay at the hospital, I thought that would be the end of it. That, that's over. No, that was just the beginning. I have been silently raped throughout the day all day sometimes and I had no clue of what was going on I didn't have a feeling that I was feeling sensual or uh, amore or what nothing it wasn't until like I would go to the bathroom and I'm like oh my god what is going on well that's when I discovered from Jesse Beltran there is such a thing called silent rape and yes I have been anally raped uh, one night, something hit my leg, and I looked around the bed, I moved over, and it, whatever it was, it kept coming, and I could feel that it was still moving on me, but I couldn't see anything. Um, halfway through this, I passed out. I, I just passed out. The next morning, I woke up, I went to the bathroom, and it was evident that I had been raped. Well, they call that electronic rape. 
um, for some reason, they do a lot of work below my waist. Uh, they have something going on where they will open my bladder, my urethra to my bladder, and I would wake up in the morning and be wet. I haven't wet the bed since I was eight years old. And they can control any part of your body that they so choose. If they decide to make you constipated for a few days, you go with that. You are literally suffering. I wrote um, a short story called Soft Torture. And a woman said, gee, a counselor said, gee, that sounds soft torture. Why soft? I said, because when you think of torture, you think of chains and whips. I said, but this is so soft, you don't see anything, you don't hear anything, you don't smell anything, but you get the effects of it. I have scars up and down my arm at certain times when the perping, that's what we call, when they're, we're being attacked. When the perping really gets heavy, my veins come up in the, my arms and my perpetrators, the letters that they have left on different papers come in my skin. A lot of times you're driving your car, you're not feeling the hits, but when you get ready to get out of your car, your hip, something is out of whack. You just have difficulty moving. Um, if you're sleeping through the night, you're sprayed. Every night I was drugged. Uh, I moved to my mother's house because they acided my home. This is um, some of the stuff that was left. This was a patent leather bag. And it was real shiny. But when they finished with it, this is what it ended up with. My shoes from my closet upstairs to the electronics, um, all of my appliances in my basement were tampered with. They were full of acid. I even had a storage room. I rented a storage and that was also tampered with acid. And what this acid would do, it would work its way through whatever the item was and then would break open. Uh, if you don't take something to sleep like uh, melatonin or Xanax, you have a very difficult time and then they come after you with elf waves that's the elf that's extra low frequency waves that's when the mind controlling goes on and after a period of time elf waves can kill you what they try to do is work you down where you have sleepless nights and the less sleep you have, the more that affects your immune system. So when your immune system breaks down, then you're open and susceptible to all types of diseases. And I found that there was a doctor, I hadn't been to the doctors in like two and a half years, and I decided I better go to a doctor. You know, I'm getting up in age, I'm 61 now, and, um, so I went to this doctor and it was just something, little things, like he was checking my ear one day and he took the deal out of my ear and I, I had complained about my nose. They do something where you get these terrific boils in your nose. And he took it out of my ear and stuck it up my nose. I was like, what are you doing? Didn't, aren't you supposed to throw them away? Oh, yes, my mistake. I'm sorry. So a light bulb went off. I'm like, I'm not feeling this guy. So then uh, something came up and Barbara and I went to New York for an open society meeting instead of me going to the doctors that day. So a month later he calls me and he asked me, was I coming back to him? And I said, I'm praying on it. He asked, don't you trust me? I said, I'm praying on that too. Well, in the meantime, he had sent me to a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist wanted me to see a neurologist. Let's see how deep this really goes. So the neurologist, when I went to him, 
I called the office. They said, we don't take your insurance. I said, well, how much will it cost? They said, anywhere from $150 to $365. Okay, so I felt it was important to see this gentleman. And after maybe 15 minutes of him talking to me, he gave me three words to remember. After about 15 or 20 minutes, he went out, he talked to my daughter. Uh, she, he came in, he said, you, you can go now. When I left and went to the desk to pay, as I was pulling out my 365, she said, it's $20. Twenty dollars? Yeah, twenty dollars. So, okay, I gladly paid him. Um, this doctor then called me again, a Dr. Rubin, Seth Rubin. He says, are you never coming back? I said, I don't think so. He said, well, Gloria, the neurologist thinks you have syphilis. I said, well, I'll tell you what, if I have syphilis, I'm a believer. I was born again 12 years ago. I think God will take me as I am, syphilis and all. So I decided, no, I'm not going back. He said, well, I'm going to call your daughter. Is it okay if I call your daughter? I said, fine. So I had called Autumn. I said, this guy is going to call you. And she says, oh, hell no. We're not discussing that. There's nothing wrong with you. He said, I just wanted to take some blood. I said, you took blood the first time. You said my blood was fine. All I needed was a little vitamin D. I was low in vitamin D. I went along with that. I said, you took blood twice before. You wanted to check my kidneys and you wanted to check my liver. I said, that's all the blood you're ever going to take from me again. Are you coming back? I said, I doubt it. Then he sent me a certified letter as if that was really going to, no, I'm not doing it. So I don't see the doctor any longer. Uh, my dentist that I had been seeing over 10 years, Dr. Craig O. Price, um, it had cost so much for me to have, I had a bridge done in my mouth. And he decided, oh, I think you need a root canal. And he removed this beautiful bridge from my mouth. And I'm like, well, why? And then he says, because we're going to do this root canal. Well, he sent me to another doctor for a root canal. And when uh, he redid the bridge, it comes back metal, so much metal. And I said, well, I'm going to try it. And I put it in my mouth. I fell asleep with it in my mouth. About 2 o'clock in the morning, it felt like something was gripping my face to the point it took two hands to pull this thing out of my head and I said never again and I just sent him a letter of regret I regret to inform you I will no longer be able to service your home and then I went on to tell him they found four RF chips uh, in my arm I had surgery I was in a military town Clarksville Tennessee I had a broken arm so I found, they found an RF chip there, an RF chip there, and one on each side of my jaw. And if you drink red wine, occasionally I do, for some reason, this one will start to click. I mean, it, it feels like, get me out of here. It, it really starts clicking. And they can go directly to your RF chips and cause a great deal of pain. You can be walking down the street and you'll see people turn around like here she comes. In their pocket they go. They bring out, uh, I guess, a cell phone with different apps on it. And you see them quickly going through it. And you might get a pain in your knee. You might get a pain in your stomach. It might go up your nose. It, anywhere on your body, they have full control of your body. And the reason I feel, I personally feel, it's my opinion, that AT&T is involved is they sent me a card one day 
And they said, these are the people that we donate to. Well, I also, on the internet, there's a group called uh, People for the American Way. And they are trying to, all these corporations that are under a group called ALEC, a very right-wing group called ALEC, they said, you know, we don't want these corporations under them because they're funding these uh, political people and that's not how it's supposed to be. So they sent me this card that said they donate to ALEC. Well, I, kept, I continued to read the card and on the back of the card, they didn't say we have 300 million, no, we, they said we have three million activists. I said, not customers? Three million activists so far. So I'm assuming that AT&T is putting out these applications that can strike your body anywhere they wish. That's it. I mean, I can go on. Well, you did, you did great. You I'm, did uh, your three minutes in about 40, but that's okay. Okay. We just went ahead and did that part. Uh, do you have any evidence, do you, when, when I asked this question earlier of Barbara, of the RFs, the chips? Just when Jesse Beltran he and did, Peter, uh, yes, um, okay. they, did, they did it and they recorded it. They filmed us. And each time they found the chip, they would put a dot on uh, our arm where they were to be, you know, where they were placed. And it just so happens that, like I said, at times they would go directly to these chips. And um, in bed, what happens when they spray this methyl bromide, which I have saved items, they would spray it so much it looks like your room is dusty. Well, I, would t I took this item and I put it in a plastic bag and put it in a storage room. And what happens after they spray you or, or spray the area, from your head to your toe, you can feel your nerve endings just all over, up and down your legs, just creeping up and down your legs, so. Uh, I joked around with you before you sat down to be filmed. You're just such a calm, mild-mannered lady. About you being nervous, you're obviously not nervous. No. Uh, how, how can you, how can you get through to the people who just will find it impossible or difficult to believe this, what can you say to them? Get tested, see if you have a chip in you. They just haven't turned it on yet. Um, what, what have you done in your career? You mentioned one thing earlier. I have a housekeeping service and I'm a grandmother of four. Okay. And uh, is there any reason that you can think of why you would have been chosen to be a target of harassment? Well, when you, I go through this, uh, my former husband was a gang stalker, which I had no clue, none whatsoever. Um, my sister is also a gang stalker. So when they talk about, you know, when the president talks about keeping the family together and how important, important it is, I'm like, bull, because I won't go near my sister. The first time she walked in my mother's house and she had something on her hip and she hit it when she went past me. And I sort of went into a, a trance or something that just felt as if my face was in conflict with this thing she had hit. Like, Maybe, you know how you put magnets together or you're trying to pull it apart? That's what I, I was feeling like I was going through. And a lot of times she would come to my mother's house and knowing I was upstairs, she could hit it and it would come right to me because of the RF chip. So, and I would find these zeros. I figured out all of the other letters because the people 
It was a girlfriend that was staying with me, a friend of over 35 years. She was staying at my house. She was waiting for a liver, a liver transplant. And um, during that time, her, her son, and my next door neighbor, because behind my house I had an apartment that I was renting out, they were aciding my house. And little did I know until one morning I was at my mother's because she had been in the hospital and I couldn't rest. I couldn't find any peace. I was moving and just, and I said, Mom, I'm going home. I have to go home now. And this is about 7.30 in the morning and the Holy Spirit came to me and said, clean under your bed, clean out your closets. I started doing that and the, the acid started rolling out. I, this is something, this was all shiny, and, but this is what they acided. This is something they got a hold of. Shoes, appliances, you name it, they hit it over that period of time that she stayed. Then they had the audacity to move a block over from where my daughter lives. So, and that's where I'm staying now, my daughter's house. But um, I don't feel, I don't have any fear there because we're up, I'm up on the third floor and I don't think my son-in-law would have, permit them to come into the house like that, you know. Um. Derek has been sending out notices about me doing the filming and everything, and I haven't ever heard from Jesse Beltran. Do you guys have a way to reach him? Because I really think that we need to uh, we need to get him because he's got the proof. Yes. Um, well, I have my opinion <laughs> about that too. All right. Is he? Uh, uh, well. Is he a good guy? I'm gonna tell you something, and, and this is just my opinion. This is and this is just my opinion. I am. Um, Always wanted to be a private detective from 77 Sunset Strip. It was back in the day. So I, and my father would always tell me, you know, be aware of your surroundings. Always be aware of your surroundings. Know where the exit is when you walk in a place. And, you know, he made me work on cars with them. And I'm like, Daddy, why are you making me do this? He said, because if you get some joker out here that wants to stop you from going where you want to go, they'll mess under your car and you'll know how to take care of it. So I'm okay, all right. Well, in the beginning of this, when I thought a car had, I had gotten a hit from a certain car that passed me, I'm driving down the highway and writing down these tag numbers. Well, one day I was sitting back and I was just checking out the tag numbers and I noticed they either had a double digit or a double letter. So then when I rode down my street one day, they all had double digits and double letters because it's like a community stalking, everyone in the community. I ran a girls group for a solid year before this happened called Girl Talk HIV AIDS Prevention. And even the girls turned against me. You know, they would walk by and hit me with whatever. They could have an envelope in their hand and do this and you would get a hit. So I had called a nephew once removed and he's on the internet, a big time CEO. And I called him, I said, Randy, is there anything you can do? Well, the message came from Randy is if he got involved because he works for the government, it would be a conflict of interest. So um, when I go to dial Jesse Beltran's number, I see double digits. <laughs> I sort of, um, mm, I pray on it and then I dial the number, so. But there is someone that continues to call and say, I am going to sue this damn Jesse Beltran because he took all this information and I haven't heard from him. So you begin to wonder, like, are, are you, were you being cattled together? And like, this is the way that the government can know what's going on, keep up with you, know your aches and jump, jump, jump. 
you know. So um, that's why when I saw this lawless America on the internet, I just assumed you knew about gang stalking, you know. <laughs> when I talked to you afterwards, I called everyone on the phone. I said, hey, call Bill Windsor. He's a guy in Lawless America. He's the one. <laughs> and they're like, okay, so I guess you were flooded that Thursday with phone calls. It's, um, it's been great. I don't have double digits in my numbers. I, that's right. That's why they I've did be it. A good guy. Yeah. And if if you, you know, I just noticed that um, people that have run up to me, what they do is to let you know that they are gang stalkers. They keep their park lights on during the day. And you, okay, well, there's a lot of cars when you turn your light, you know, you start it up, your lights come on. Okay, well, I let them get around me, and then I check, and there's double digits or double numbers. So I often wondered if either it was my ex-husband, because he hated the fact that my daughter married who he did, and I had their wedding reception in my backyard, or I assumed it was maybe a pharmaceutical company because I had girl talk, HIV AIDS prevention. If we prevented that many AIDS cases, look at all the money they would lose out on. But I honestly, truly feel that it was the chief of police because he sent that little squeal to come to me and say, they say you're losing your mind. So. I really feel it was that. Let's them. do a, a soundbite saying, uh, just the, I believe it's the chief of police of whatever, of wherever. Uh, Morton, wait a minute. I had a whole list. I could give you a whole list of people. Well, if you please him, let's zero it in on him. Okay, let's zero we it in. We don't have to name him. We don't okay. Have to name. Just say, you know, uh, look at me and just say, I believe it's the chief of police who's responsible for having these calls. I believe it's the chief of police from Morton Borough, Delaware County, Eugene Garnier, that had me stopped, had me victimized. It's perfect because you said I believe, but we got his name in there and the place. Right. And mm -hmm. Anything else you want to say? And you, you covered all the territory, but is there anything else? No, except that I, I did take, I have my former husband's tag number, which is H H two two, and then he's something else, and um, I kept finding these O's on my paper, uh, these Illuminati marks or something, and I'm like, I don't know what the heck it is. You know, am I supposed to be afraid of it? Is it giving me a message? And one other thing is um, the way I know my mail was being tampered with. I had a, this Xerox, you know, when you're changing your address. Well, this was on the inside of the letter. The letter, was, it was folded up and like it had never been opened. No thing on the outside stating a change of address. And when I opened it up, I found the yellow sticker inside of the letter as opposed to being on the outside. So, and I don't get my mail on time. Um, the bank, I do believe, took $1,000 from me, which is the Wells Fargo Bank. Um, I went to the bank that morning and I went to make, well, I was writing out my mortgage check and I just put the one down and the Holy Spirit said, go to the bank first. I went to the bank and I only had $400 in there as opposed to 1400 So I'm like, okay. I, because I vowed from the very beginning, I will not cry behind this. You will not make me cry. If, I, if you see tears in my eyes, it's something my grandchildren did or something awesome like that. But this, no. Um, I went to the post office after that, praying all the way, Lord, give me the strength to keep my cool. And when I went to the post office, the little fat gentleman 
because he sits in the chair all day, scoots over, mm, scoots over, stands up. I said, I want a book of stamps, payday, and laid the stamps down. So I'm like, payday? Then after that, I realized this big circle you're in is one big circle because when the, I, they started stalking me in June, in July they changed my mortgage company and I have had problems with them ever since and in February when they asked it in my house I said to hell with it I'm out of here I called them up I said put this place in foreclosure I'm gone as of this day they still call me about why don't we do a remodification? I'm like, do you people understand me? Are you getting my mail? Are you listening to me? So it's just one big continuous circle. And it, I feel that when my name comes up, because I called the DPA when they, um, about the aciding, you know, uh, and they were going along with it and listening to me and talking to me about it. And then they said, what's your name? I said, <clears throat> Gloria Wellburn. Oh, well, you're going to have to call so-and-so. Okay. It's a never-ending nothing. No one can help you. Um, or they'll say, oh, yes, yes, I call this person. And you call that person because they told me to call the, the DA's office and I called the DA's office and they said, what? They're gang stalking you. Oh, no, we're not going to have that. And come in right away and fill out a report. And I did. And she comes back out and says, oh, you don't have any proof. Oh, okay. I had one gentleman. His name was Brian, and he was from Ted Erickson's office. And just out of the clear blue sky, I decided to call that office because I called everyone else, my congressman, everyone. I called the office. I said, who am I speaking with? He said, this is Brian. I said, Brian, have you ever heard of psychotronic gang stalking? He said, yes, I have. He said, where do you live? I said, Morton Borough. He said, sue the damn borough. I said, oh, okay. But then the very next day, a woman called me up and said, you've been misinformed. You know, um, you can't, don't do that. Don't sue the borough. Yeah. Sure, don't sue the borough. Uh-huh. All right, well, that's a wrap. Thank you.